All right, guys, we're talking to Larry Clance now. He's going to take the hand off and explain the whole process of building a McPherson guitar. We're looking at the, a shelf full of wood here. Larry, do you want to tell us what we're looking at? Sure. This is uh, back and side sets for upcoming orders. We have uh, obviously many species that all your viewers are well aware of. We have a Madagascar rosewood, quilted maple, striped macassar ebony, um, you know, black-hearted sassafras. The one thing that's really unique for McPherson is because we are a smaller company, we do about 150, maybe 200 guitars a year maximum. Um, by being that small, we can build one, two, or five of one species for the entire year. So we don't mass produce anything. Right. Uh, we average about 14, 16 guitars built per month. We have six employees that uh, luthiers. There's two box builders uh, building the body of the guitar. I have Eric over there right now, you know, binding a guitar. Well, what, what Eric does, say the first of the month, I will give him eight work orders, whether they're a custom order uh, for an individual or we're talking, you know, six string, 12 string, or the Camriel, right hand, left hand. Basically, I just give him a sheet of paper saying, this is what I need in six months, which is our build time, give me a finished guitar. Um, nobody touches Eric's wood nobody touches his tools you know that's his thing that's mm -hmm. that's kind of the benefit of having a custom shop like this yeah. they can kind of you know they went to school to be luthiers with the dream of building their own guitars owning their own business all that and we give them that opportunity to really take the time to be experts at what they do um eric you know as a 30 year old man that came in here with a couple years of luthier school experience I consider him a master because of what he gives us. The final result is pretty close to perfection. They can oversee every step of the process. There's no chance of someone doing something that he's not aware of, and he can detect how everything interacts, yeah. and thumping here and there or whatever. Um, again, that's that's kind of the the love that we have yeah. for what we do here. Is that you know I will say, Eric, I need a four and a half inch, which is the thickness of the body, uh, full body McPherson six string out of Indian rosewood and Adirondack top. And that's all I tell him. He knows the bracing, the size of the sound hole, since we have a regular and an extra large sound hole, uh, which is all part of a recipe mat put together. But by just giving him that information, he then has the artistic freedom or liberty to choose which piece of Indian rosewood out of our selection. Because you know the amount of colors that are in there, you have purples, browns, reds. Um, and he actually marries the two pieces of wood, you know, the back side and the top, so if it's like a, say, a real expensive Brazilian rosewood custom, uh, we'll put him on the phone with the customer. You know, this is who's going to be building your guitar. You guys talk about, you know, the kind of bear class Sitka. Do you want a, a 2A, 3A, or 4A? You know, how spectacular do you want it? There's no difference in the price, but we make it unique, unique for the builder, unique for the customer that's getting it. It has a personal connection with you know, I'm going to see pictures of my guitar being built over yeah. six months because, you know, that, that's just who we want to be in a yeah. sense. Uh, and we have the luxury, I guess, in, you know, with Matt's freedom that he's given us to do something like that. So it's, it's like the best job in the world, yeah. in, you know, reality. So, so each guy who builds the body can sort of envision a final product all in his own head. He knows, yeah, you can just see in his head, like, I want it to look like this instead of like it's his. in another it's his. type of building environment. Someone might choose one of those pieces, someone else chooses the other one, or it's whatever's on the shelf. Oh, this is our brace kit. Matt showed you the rosewood, Sitka rosewood, mm -hmm. and this is basically uh, how we put them together. Three separate pieces. This is the, the back of a guitar. We buy them backs only. There's no sides. It's just a matching set. So they're out of the same uh, batch. Piece of Sitka spruce, and it's a very clean Sitka. We don't have knots, pinholes. You know, it's nice, clean wood. And uh, they're... Uh, position, the grain goes the same direction. These are sized to whatever Matt's recipe tells us. And then we comb glue on these um, on the inside, sandwich them together, put them in the vacuum fixture for two hours, 147 pounds uh, or lots of pressure, vacuuming down, sucks all the air out, holds them down nice and flat. From here, they go into a CNC machine. Uh, the reason we use a CNC is because it, we can't replicate that kind of perfection on bracing, and braces do need right. to be exact. 
So that's one of the machines that's very important to us is our CNC mainly for more than anything else for our bracing. The bracing. Yeah, those little tiny gaps between in the overpasses under and the overpasses mass. that yeah, it'd be so, tough. Uh, these are made by one one builder, one of our box builders here. Does all the bracing. He knows how to sand them. Uh, all the details that go into them, and they are made to order. We don't mass produce things. So with the, one of these builders getting a job order, needing a Rosewood Sitka Rosewood or a Sitka Rosewood Sitka full of regular kits, all that, you know, they're given their work order. Uh, the tops are made by Eric as far as put together, sound holes, uh, sound hole binding, all that. So Eric makes the bodies, but he also makes the tops. Matt, this Matt makes the bracing, but he also makes the guitars. So those, you know, keep everything to themselves right in this room. These guys work side by side and giving each other what they need. Um, okay, now, a lot of acoustic luthiers swear by, like, hide glue mm -hmm. or have very, like, builders can really geek out over glue types. Yeah. What, what, you can tell, what can you tell people about the glue you guys are using uh, for the uh, braces and other stuff? Uh, we use standard type bond. It seems to work best. Um, Eric, type bond, or type bond two, for you certain. Type bond one. one. Yes, yeah, for all the boxes and whatnot. You know, all those decisions are made by Matt McPherson. Uh, hundreds of prototypes, years of prototyping, and continual research as we go. It's, he's never, you know, like you saw earlier, he's never set, okay, it's good enough, I'm going to go do something else. Uh, it's never set. So he continues to come in and he'll look in the showroom. How's the sunlight hitting the wood? Is there a reflection? Is there a raised area? I mean, little details. Uh, he, he searches for imperfections in our product to make us a better company. And uh, again, one of the benefits being that we only do 150, 200 guitars a year, we can easily stop something, make a change, make a running change without too much of a uh, disruption, you know, in the process here. Okay. Should we take a look at the kerfing forms over here, or? Uh, yeah, the or is that is that uh, out of the uh, standard? <laughs> yeah, you know, just standard. Uh, yeah, the kerfing, we, we mix them with water, put them inside benders, which we have outside here. Uh, we make some out of aluminum side benders. We also have some wood. Again, these are bent per their work orders. That's why there's only you know, one for each of the builders. They are working on six to eight pieces at one time, uh, guitars, because there's so much dry time. They'll bend these, and they'll also be binding a guitar. He's going to be working on a top. He's bending the back and sides. He's gluing the backs together. All these little different steps, and he has to do every piece of it himself. So you've really got to prioritize, like, okay, I can't, I can't just keep going on with the body here. I got to yes. have that stuff ready for when I'm done. So, but we do leave it to their scheduling. Yeah. All we do is uh, trust them to have it in the right order. order. And again, I, I consider these guys master yeah. luthiers and great businessmen. Also, they understand what we are trying to accomplish. That's why they work here. Right. So, here you go. Any problems? They deal with that problem themselves because it's theirs. Yeah. Uh, they know what Matt's rules are as far as perfections. We don't repair it. Like there's a crack in a piece of wood. You know, we can glue it, we can fix it. Uh, we don't. You know, it's just not who we are. It's not fair to the customer for the kind of price we charge. So we strive for perfection and we understand things happen with wood. All right, Larry, so we've stepped into another room just outside where Matt was working. You've got Gigantor here. This is a side bender. Tell us about, is this your own design or? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a machinist out back, and you'll, you'll notice as you walk around the shop, you'll see our, our uh, fixtures uh, to hold the body, parabolic sanders, and side benders are all aluminum. We built all these ourselves. The reason we chose to do that is our peace of mind for excellence. Mm -hmm. If we build it ourselves, there's no one to blame. Mm -hmm. Everything is perfect. That's why we chose to do it out of aluminum. Wood on wood is going to move a little bit, and you know the original side benders, these older ones, you know, it's heated up, water's on there, wood's gonna move a little bit. Right. I didn't want our builders having to take time to try to fight with a piece of wood that's not, you know, reacting like it needs to. So these are the ones that you never these use? These are the ones you buy. These are the ones we build. Big difference. Uh, we got, you know, this is, I consider highly engineered, over-engineered for what it needs to do, but again, that's what we do here. You know, we try to, to strive in excellence. Um, Dean, our head machinist here, he, he designed it, you know, with the proper uh, two sides here. He has ceramic spacers inside so the heat doesn't transfer up here, it stays right down here. Um, we've got the, you know, the heat uh, blankets here, dip them in water, put them in here. You know, it's basic, it's just yeah. a, a better mold 
that is very solid and if it's molded to this plate, it's exact every time. Parabolic sanders, we have one for the top and one for the back. You know, we built all these ourselves, obviously, except for the electronics and the motor, but putting them together, welding the frames, uh, we just told Dean what we wanted to do. That was all done by hand up until seven years ago, you know, sanding it. And it had taken an hour and 20 minutes for one of our luthiers to parabolic uh, the sides of a guitar. This does it in two minutes because the weight of the aluminum uh, fixtures there, those are 22 pounds each with the wood in there and they just gently go down with gravity in two minutes uh, once they hit those spacers, that's say 973. So you put the piece of wood on there, yep. put these all four of these on and it keeps it. Yes, and if you still hear a sound, like there's a void, it's not perfect, we go to a different size. Just take them off and drop it down. So, you know, it, it polices itself off of the sound. Our guys can hear if, if it's still uh, consistently sounding or if there's a, a skip in a sense, you know. You know, after the sides are bent, the kerfing goes on, uh, neck and tail block. From this point, we'll be putting side braces on. Uh, we don't have any in this rack right now, but there's black little marks here on all these, and that's actually where our side braces are going to go. That's where our top and back braces line up. So it, the energy goes through the entire box. Side braces are all hand-shaped out of African mahogany, glued in. Uh, all this is going to be sanded inside. We don't allow a pencil mark, any glue. You can see how clean all these little slots are. There's no glue inside there. We don't allow water coloring or staining on the kerfing, though nobody will ever see this. It's irrelevant on what the customer sees. It's about you know what we were hired to build. Is. You never know who's going to get out their dentist mirror anyway. You never know. So, uh, <laughs> but we're we're ready for them in a sense. Um, so, and then we have some for three and a half inch thick bodies, some for left-handed, some for 12 inch. You can see we have one back there for four and a half inch thick body. It's just excellence. It's a perfect fit for everything we do and it just makes everyone's job easier. How long are they in these molds? Um, it depends on their work uh, flow, but usually each step is one day to allow the glue to naturally cure on its own. So once they get the sides bent, he's working on the back or the top, let that set. Uh, once the this has been parabolic, you can tell by the sand there. Um, from there, he'll clean it all up, put the side braces on, let that set a day. When that's done, he'll be ready to attach the back okay. and the top. And then he does a, a sanding of the whole body before it goes out to the finish area. All right, Larry, so what's next up here in the next station? <clears throat> well, Eric, uh, one of our luthiers, also puts all the tops together for uh, Eric and Matt. Uh, each different position of wood. Here's a different species. So here's our Sitka spruce top. We put the two together. Instead of a butt joint like most companies use when we put the uh, pieces together, it's hard to see at this angle, but we actually use a 17 degree bevel angle. What that does, it gives us more glue surface. It gives us more strength because there's more glue and more surface material touching, but also uh, it's less opt to splitting on a seam. So once we get the tops approved to be cut out to the proper shape, we then put a sound hole in. Most companies, uh, actually all of them that I'm aware of, put uh, you know binding or rosette around there. Well, what we use is a solid piece of koa, ebony, walnut, whatever the binding is, if it's rosewood, this is going to be a solid piece. Uh, the reason we chose to do that is originally, we you know started out just putting the binding on and we found our guitars with koa. There's so much color in a piece of koa that you could always see where the two, where the seam was. And Matt didn't like joints or seams, you know. So he uh, engineered uh, a solid block of koa as far as the, the machine to cut it out. And this actually is glued in to a little pocket. There's a little rim here, so the outside is actually a little bit oversized. So it goes right to the right depth, is glued in. And then we put a graft on the back for our bracing. And then this will be cut out on a CNC machine. But now, it, now what's like the, let's say like five black, layers black, there? Yeah, yeah that, that's just the uh, piece of purfling, black, white, black purfling. So after this is in, then we machine a slot out. And this you know, is bendable to the size that we need. 
and shape it, and that's put in with epoxy. Mm -hmm. And all this is done in vacuum, so there's no clamping, just solid vacuum holding it flat. Yeah, that's not visible from the front, right? No, the, no. So that just helps to the, adhere better? Consistent. Yeah, if you put a clamp or a weight in a specific area, you're always gonna have a void. There's always gonna be something not solid, so by using the vacuum, pieces like that, it just makes it consistent. Um, so tops are done. From there, you know, we uh, Eric would put them on the body. All right, so here you've got the top being glued onto the box. Yeah, it's old school. You know, the old fiberglass go bars. Uh, the yellow ones, when they're new, you get about 25 pounds when they're bent like this each. There's a lot of, of uh, poundage holding that top on. There is so much pressure that the wood here was actually bending. So we put a solid plate of aluminum to stiffen it. The uh, disc is parabolic to the same radius as the back which would be a 15-foot radius, because the back is already on this. And then we put this very soft rubber, just to make sure nothing uh, would dent, uh, make any imperfections in the back. The top is then glued on. These locator pins here make sure that, that the top is positioned properly for the side braces, so everything is continued uh, to be a solid skeletal structure inside, if you will. We have two CNC machines and one gantry. Uh, the CNC gantry is used to cut the outside profile. Again, they're time savers, they're not a, a skill uh, thing. And they put the sound holes in for us. This machine is used mainly to cut out the bracing and to shape our bridges. Those are the two main features. However, the machine was sitting here, not being used every day because of the small number that we do. So I asked our machinist if he could create a fixture in a program to uh, do some fret work for us, or the, the fingerboard. All that used to be done by hand, you know, sanding and whatnot. So what he did was create, uh, against putting a radius on the ebony fingerboard. Okay. It's not doing the final version, just this takes the, uh, the rough sanding down. Right. So we still have to take this off. It'll be fine sanded after. Fine sanding by hand. It's just, it's saving about 45 minutes of labor. We put it in here, let it do its job while the guys do something else. So what are we looking at here, Larry? Well, this CNC machine is used exclusively to get our necks ready for hand shaping. Uh, we have 16 different fixtures that we easily swap out on this machine. Uh, you know, we start with a, a huge block of African mahogany, and to cut that um, on a CNC would wear out cutters and whatnot, so we take that block, put it in here, and it traces the outline of two necks for us, about an eighth inch deep. But it also gives us two locator holes per neck. And what those locator holes do is they clamp into each of our fixtures, so everything is always zeroed out off of that. We then take that uh, African mahogany blank to the bandsaw, and we freehand, following those trace lines, two necks. From that point, it goes through 16 different uh, machining processes because we use that carbon insert, a big rod that goes inside. Um, it drills out. In place of a truss rod. In place of a truss rod. Uh, uh, we have another pole that's drilled here, which is a brass pin that goes through. So you screw your, uh, your bolt, your body into that neck through brass. That way the wood swelling or shrinking isn't gonna loosen up your bolts. So all those little steps like that CNC is more precise than doing it by hand. Again, early days, all this was done by hand. And uh, just had a little mill in the back corner, and we'd sit there and watch that mill go back and forth, back and forth. You know, I mean, it'd take like 11 hours to do a neck. Will we get to see an example of the um, carbon insert? Sure, right over here. Cool. So this is our uh, 32 mil unidirectional woven carbon fiber rod. Uh, we have these custom made for us. Um, there's a lot of weight to it, purposely, because Matt was talking about rigidity and transfers of energies and things like that. Oh, wow. So that's where a lot of the weight of a McPherson comes from, is in the heavier tuner keys and this rod. So we, uh, in this CNC machine, will pocket out this full size right out into it. Is that why there was such a huge drill bit in yes, that machine over there? That cutter bit is made, it was made specifically to this radius. So that goes all the way down. We then take this piece, it's rounded on the end. We will round it off in this machine so it's perfect fit. We use a slow setting marine grade epoxy that used to build boats out of. And uh, we will 
paint it in a sense inside, drop this in and rock it back and forth until we see air bubbles. So this is solid in there, no air bubbles at all. We then uh, clamp this in certain locations and that'll sit for 24 hours. It's slow setting, very strong. If the wood will never move unless this is twisted when it goes in. I mean, that's how stable it is. So is the, the marine grade epoxy used because the other tight bond one that you use on everything else would not adhere to this, yeah, this material? Yeah, bond as well. This is a, a slippery glass-like surface. And uh, Matt felt that marine grade epoxy, the West system, works best for this. We mix up a little bit at a time per neck um, and just sits in there overnight or for the next day. So we do four necks per week. There's so many different steps involved. And we have one person that's his whole job is from start to finish to the hand shaping, he does the necks. Um, so I just, you know, like earlier you said, 93 Telecaster neck a customer wanted. I just say, Ryan, so-and-so wants a specific, you know, radius neck. And most of these guys, they're all players. They all know or own all these guitars anyways. This is their passion. Yeah. So I don't have to give them the measurements. They already know what they are or they do it by feel and get really close. So this would be in, the next day we drill a brass pin here. Uh, goes all the way through. Comes out the back side. And uh, what we do with that is that's where the two bolts will go through into the brass. It'll be hand tapped and whatnot and screwed in. Why the choice for brass instead of I don't know, titanium or steel or st stainless steel? Uh, yeah, we have used aluminum for uh, certain artists that want a female, they want a lighter guitar. So by getting rid of the brass, we have used aluminum in place of carbon. And we've used it in place of this pin at times, uh, aluminum. Um, again, this is engineered for weight in a sense on how Matt wanted to transfer so much energy across the body. And by having heavier pieces here, the energy is going to come across the body sooner, giving it a longer time to resonate. Um, so that was part of it. Again, the, some of these are splitting hairs in a yeah. sense, but again, as a as an engineer, they strive to split hairs. Um, I can show you a piece over here of this actual brass pin. Okay. <laughs> so these are solid brass. We have them machined in town here. They're tapered and they're uh, ribbed. The reason for doing that is as, as this is a solid straight hole. As this goes in, the uh, taper is going to force the epoxy up and it's going to lock into these ribs so it keeps it from ever sliding this way. However, it doesn't keep it from possibly twisting that way if the wood expanded enough to cause that. So what we've done then, this goes like that. We've also drilled another hole, once this is dried, set an epoxy and it goes right here and it comes right through there and comes out the bottom side. So you see a little hole down here mm -hmm. and a hole on top. And these are hand screwed in. Oh, it comes th through the through surface the between brass. where the, the uh, fretboard will be mounted yeah. to. Yeah. So it goes, goes through here, comes right through there, and comes out the back side. Those are all hand tap. The CNC will drill the hole for perfection, and then we'll tap it and screw that in. And that's all just to max, maximize rigidity and transfer all of that yes. energy. Yep. Transference. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a unique system. Uh, it's an expensive system yeah. in a sense. But you know, I can confidently say our, our necks are strongest in the industry as far as the stiffness. So they never move. But from here, you can see we have four, four necks. This is where the uh, screw is going to be screwed into there. Do you have to sand it after this step before you apply the fretboard, I assume, to get up yeah, the extra CNC epoxy? Will come level that. Okay. Yeah, that's another one of the 16 CNC steps. And then from there, you know, we'll drill the holes. Everything is pretty much coming together here. The next step would be a 3D uh, machine. It gets rid of all this bulk, and it would bring us to basically this neck here. From here is where all the hand shaping is done. You see, we still have a lot of ridges here, a uh, ridge down here. You know, it's just the machine's got the bulk of it out as a time saver. From here, uh, fingerboards are put on and whatnot, and then Ryan will do the shaping for the customer's request. So here we got Ryan uh, hand shaping the neck. So he's got his sanding blocks, 
uh, files, chisels, whatever it needs to do the job. Um, pretty much all of our next last seven, eight years, you hand shape, right? He also does a dry fit because of our cantilever design. They, uh, the necks are custom fitted per guitar. They're made per guitar. Some people want a different head cap, uh, wrapped on the back, their names put in, different color bindings, different shapes. So uh, the necks are not even made until the body is done, inspected, and passed through the system. Then he gets the work order to make that neck. What are some of the toughest parts of this process, or what are what can you what insights can you give us about what you do on this? Oh, basically, getting it to right to this part, you're golden. But I mean, problems can come up like when you mill into wood, and then surprise, you know, there's a problem. But um, pretty much once you once you rough fit it and you get it to shape, then you know you're safe. So. Now, the surprises he was talking about were sometimes there's a pitch pocket, a little pin uh, knot or something shows up. That's not acceptable in our world again of perfection. So. Yeah, we have a, a week's worth of work to this point. Plus, so you'll just scrap the whole thing, and we will generally scrap those. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this brings back to one of the previous steps where you're talking about putting the brass insert in. Mm -hmm. I assume that and the screw going down from here into it is mostly necessary because of the cantilever design with the the fretboard hanging over the edge of the top, yeah. it can't rely on the top to have any support from that? Yeah, it, uh, well, how Matt says, it triangulates it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have just a lot of extra support through here, stiffening this area up to allow this to float. Another um, way that we can get this, I mean, one, one person asked me, well, how does this thin piece of wood keep from curling? Mm -hmm. You know, in a different humidity and temperature, though this is solid, well, they just saw this as a piece of wood. Well, this is actually, that carbon comes all the way out to the very end. So this is carbon with a fingerboard attached to it. That's why it doesn't curl. Now, is the white layer we're seeing sandwich in there, is that just cosmetic or is that? Strictly cosmetic. It's just a black, white, black purfling. Uh, all right, what happens after this? From here, uh, the necks are, are fitted to the bodies. And you can see this, there's a number. That's a order number on the work order and this neck will have the same number written on it. So this neck is custom made and shaped to this body. Some of these you will see do not have a, a white surface here. So these, we're kind of working our way around this rack. Uh, what Ryan does, he takes the body and he will square this off because there's a little bit of radius here. So he squares this off and then he's going to dry fit this neck. He's going to actually attach it right to the body, fit it in there, and he's going to find out where the placement of the bridge is and putting those two locator holes there. Measure the uh, scale length to the proper place. Um, so all that is part of what Ryan does in shaping the necks and fitting the necks. Are they all sort of standard 25 and a half inch? Yes, or? yes all of them are. But, uh, you know, so the necks follow these guitars. You see all have order numbers on them. And they just work their way around. From there, Tony will do the spraying. We use a Italian uh, UV polyester. We have six coats of polyester. We have grain filler and UV sealer put on these. So it's a week long process of spraying each guitar. Um, we could do it faster. We could rush through again. Our business plan is to do four, five guitars a week. So everything is scheduled on Monday as a sprayer. He's gonna put sealer on so many guitars, bake them in the UV oven, you know, the grain fillers and do whatnot, and then work his way through the system. Also spraying the necks and prepping them. So here's guitar bodies that have been sprayed, but you can see the orange peel on here, the ripples everywhere. Uh, so this all has to be sanded down flat. So it's just sitting here for about a week. That's hand sanded? All hand sanded, yes. And the necks are alongside of them, so now they're, they're gonna be finished all at the same time. So they work their way around, uh, around the back, be wet sanding, down to a 2000 grit, and then we do a, a buffing, four different buffing grits, and then after that we do a hand polish. Uh, once that's done, they're brought over here. From this point, Mike does the inspection over oh, here. Oh, that's gorgeous. He bridge on. What is that? Back uh, this is a Zircote Camriel model with that's amazing. Binding. Yeah, it's gorgeous. One of my favorite woods. However, you can see we haven't pulled the Mylar tape off of here yet to attach the bridge. This is made to the same thickness as our finish. We'll take a razor blade, go across here, peel this mylar off, exposing raw wood so we can glue right to a direct surface without routing into the end grain of the wood. However, the reason that 
that this is not uh, pulled off and there's still paper inside because it has to go back. Hmm. Inside this black circle, I don't know if you can see it, but inside that black circle there's a speck of dust or a pin, little dot there. That's some attention to detail. That has to be fixed. <laughs> so that's just marked for us. So uh, we will rough that up, put drop fuel in it, bake it in the oven again, polish it, make it go away. Does someone go over these with like a magnifying glass uh, to detect Mike, that? Mike, our inlay artist, this is what he does. That's why he's as good as he is. Um, each one of these, you know, there's four little dots on the back, two dots on the top. So he puts little marks on here so he knows once he inspects them, he'll mark them, no one touches them until he gets them signed off that they're perfect. Uh, I mean, it's really... It's intense. Sense. Yeah, yeah. So you're the guy who finds all these microscopic specks on the finish. Uh, I guess, yeah. It's part of my job. Well, just to, How long does it typically take you, and do you use like magnifying glass, or you just like have to go get your eyes tested every week? Or? No, I just have an array of lighting here where I get, I get all kinds of angles, and um, I can see every, I guess, every little um, detail. Maybe easier at this position in the shop than other people can in other, other places, but... Um, just, that's usually a five or ten minute process just to grab a buff body and make sure it's not sanded through anywhere and there's no major major flaws with it. And how does your how long does your average inlay design take? Sort of the standard or whatever. Uh, it, it depends. Um, depends on what people are after. I mean, some of them have been more intensive than others, but um, you know, generally people are just looking for something small and, and not terribly expensive just to make the guitar their own. Um, and it might only require three or four hours of work between design and execution to create something that just makes their guitar unique to them rather than something off the shelf, which is what I think really a lot of people are trying to achieve with that is just, just some individuality with their instrument. Do they usually like send in sketches or like say, hey, here's a link to something I kind of like. Can you sort of design something around that? Or? Yeah, generally when people get into the more elaborate inlays, they already have an idea in their head or have seen something that they really like and they want to pursue something similar to that. But, um, you know, and oftentimes people are just looking for some direction as to something simple they can do just to dress it up a little bit, just simple fret markers or, or uh, you know, a name in the back of the headstock or, some, again, something just to make it their own. Is this something you're working on right now? Uh, I haven't actually started. I, I, I've went through the design process with the guy, and he actually sent this, this image to us, um, and I just have to simply scale it to a guitar and send it, you know, place it on a guitar and get approval on, on what um, materials to be used. And, you know, generally requires a few bounce a few emails back and forth and figure out what what exactly they're after as far as give a different a few different options size wise things like that but how long would a design like that take for you to I would anticipate something like that would take me you know six to eight hours to, to do and you yeah. and you hand cut all of that uh, d depends yes yeah. so, some um, there's a fine line between what's what's efficient to do by hand and what's not some and, and again what's efficient to do with the CNC um, you know, CNC can, can be a great thing for repetition if you're going to do something more than once, but oftentimes something like that I can do quicker by hand from a good drawing than, than I can put that into a CNC and program all the parts. And, and you still have to go through the tedious process of, of actually inlaying it. So um, I guess, we, you know, it's a it's, uh, decision you have to make with each project as to what's, what's the best way to go about it, what, what's going to yield the best end product. So. All right. Cool. Thanks, Mike.